Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining me for uh, Structured Analytic Techniques for Improving Information Security Analyses. Um, I'm Rabbit. No, really, I am. Uh, I'm sometimes also known as JJ uh, professionally if I need a boring name for resumes and things. Um, I'm currently the head of product security and security operations for a company called Latch. Latch makes smart access devices and smart home integrations and uh, a number of things for residential buildings that are sort of the Internet of Things variety. We like to think that uh, we make uh, things that are a step above uh, what you probably typically think of when you hear the term Internet of Things. Uh, in the background, I, I'm a former biometric device uh, uh, penetration tester. I've done some medical uh, security, hospital engineering. Uh, I entered information security from the field of epidemiology and public health research. Uh, so my previous year and a half has been a real interesting ride, having some of that become uh, national uh, uh, you know, stories, international stories. Uh, my informal introduction to information security is when I completely wrecked the PDP 1184 uh, at my high school. You never forget the sound of the heads hitting the platters on those old deck drives. That's, that's all I'm saying about that. And an interesting thing about me, uh, I was raised around my father's uh, very weird and large collection of robots. So I'm basically like a budget version of Shinji Akari. So what are structured analytical techniques? Um, structured analytical techniques are a set of tools, tricks, uh, uh, fun uh, ways to manipulate data that can help you discover and eliminate biases. Uh, they can improve the accuracy and reliability of your conclusions. Uh, they can ensure that all data is being equally considered and including, included during analysis, and uh, they can enhance your creativity. So where did this come from? Uh, a few years back, I was perusing files on the CIA.gov website, as one does, and I came across something called a Tradecraft Primer. Structured Analytic Techniques for Improving in Intelligence Analysis, uh, and written by, prepared by US government. So I never found out who actually wrote this thing, but I assume it's you know one of these people. Um, just a heads up, there's no connection between me and the CIA or me and these authors. I just happen to be a guy who found this. Uh, so uh, you know, nothing that. I do think though that maybe uh, one of them might read it eventually. So just in case, so uh, a good paper. And also just to point out, uh, anything that the CIA publishes with the words a tradecraft primer on it, I am absolutely going to read that. So what portion of this is mine? What have I done? Um, I initially thought about this mostly. It was rattling around in my head in terms of how you might use it for open source intelligence or for threat intelligence. Uh, it's kind of a natural fit, it's just intelligence analysis. But as I like all of us, I probably don't do anything that cool most of the time. Most of my time I'm spent, you know, doing some more normal infosec stuff uh, for my orgs. And so I started thinking about how could I apply these same techniques to stuff I do on a more day-to-day -day basis or, um, you know, or sort of more mundane or it might have a more widely applicable, uh, you know, user base. So uh, there are three types of structured uh, analytic techniques. The first one is diagnostic techniques. Those are used to improve uh, quality and make sure that your analyses are based on quality information. The second type uh, are con contrarian techniques. These are for making sure analyses are not biased or based on limited thinking. And uh, the last type is imaginative thinking techniques. Uh, these are for developing new insights, uh, breaking out of the box, or seeing things from potentially new viewpoints. So the first structured analytical technique we'll take a look at, it's called just a key assumptions check. It's a, kind of an easy one to start with. It's very easy to describe. It's literally taking, uh, all, thinking about all of the assumptions you made when coming to a conclusion or performing an analysis and writing them down, creating a list of things you've just assumed. Um, you uh, may review the assumptions periodically as you do the analysis, just to see if your opinion of them has changed. Maybe. Uh, you discover you made an uh, assumption you don't remember making or didn't think as of as an assumption at the time, or maybe you know uh, you need to do uh, some uh, rethinking about some of the stuff you had assumed in the first place. An example of how this might 
help you in uh, information security is uh, let's say you're replacing an old layer three firewall with a new next gen, uh, you know, blinky light layer seven firewall. Uh, it's got deep packet inspection and it does protocol identification and all kinds of cool things that your layer three didn't. What are some uh, assumptions you may have made that may come back to bite you uh, in having made that decision? Well, you may have assumed that newer is better. Often it is not. It isn't always. Uh, you may have assumed that the default settings on the new firewall would block malicious traffic. Maybe you know you brought it out of the box and put it in a place, and it's expecting you to do a lot more tuning than you realized. Um, you may have assumed you really only needed to worry about incoming packets versus uh, exfiltration or outgoing traffic. Uh, or you may not, you may assume that it doesn't pass traffic until it knows that traffic is good or bad. That's the one that, uh, particularly why I chose this example is because I've encountered layer seven firewalls that uh, allow 32K or 64K of data to move before they decide if a protocol is bad or not. Uh, and at the time of someone who was trying to exfiltrate, all that really meant to me was that if I cut my data into 32 or 64K chunks, I could pass right through the firewall by just restarting the session every 32 or 64 K and it would never clamp off on that protocol uh, as being malicious because it, it didn't have time. Uh, so another technique is a uh, quality of information check. Uh, that is basically where you go through all of your information and judge, uh, judge it for its strength, its weaknesses, its importance, and its confidence. Um, it's something you can use throughout the analytical process, and it, you should be performing it probably periodically. Uh, it helps you detect errors in processing or collection of information, uh, errors in translation or errors in tr uh, interpretation. It can identify attempts to, at deception or denial strategies if you happen to discover that maybe there's some specific problem with your data. And it can assist in communicating the amount of confidence that you have in your assumptions and key information. Uh, so uh, it's pretty easy to do. All you do is take each information you're basing your assumption or conclusion on, uh, identify which of them are critical to that result, and then consider uh, if it involves interpreted information, has that been interpreted in the right context or with you know a, a complete understanding of, of how that should probably be interpreted. An information security example, uh, so you're working incident response and analyzing a log file sent to you by an ops team. Uh, what are some quality of information checks you could do uh, to make sure you're working with quality source material? Well, you might check that the timestamps are accurate. They probably aren't. Uh, are you confident that the log hasn't been tampered with? Is there some mechanism you can use to prove that it has some you know, uh, veracity to it? Uh, are you confident that log is real in the first place? It, you know, maybe that someone left one for you to find. Uh, and lastly, does does the log even capture the type of information you're looking? I mean, maybe you have your device configured such that the event you're looking to correlate isn't even captured in that log. Um, those are all things you could check to improve the quality. Uh, so another technique, indicators or signposts of change. This is where you create a list of events or monitoring targets uh, that will tell you if your situation has changed. Uh, essentially, you uh, identify a bunch of uh, competing hypotheses, you know, ways that the, and, and a situation may go. And then you create lists of potentials, act, potential activities or statements or events uh, for each scenario, right? If you start going down one of these paths, you may list out what would you expect to start seeing happen. Um, and then you regularly review and update your, your indicators uh, to make sure you're watching for these things. And so if you start seeing these indicators in your environment, you've got some idea of what path uh, uh, an event might be taking. So uh, information security example, uh, you may want to protect your organization from a system-wide ransomware attack. You think you're in good shape because your uh, org uses cloud storage and your domain controllers are regularly patched. Um, you might, uh, what might be some signposts that this uh, assessment you've made that you don't really need to worry about it too much might be changing and you might need to rethink that scenario or rethink that risk or conclusion. Well, for one, if ransomware attackers start leveraging or attacking specifically cloud storage providers a lot more, that's a fundamental change to their tactics and, and their uh, uh, you know, uh, TTPs by your estimation. 
So that should cause you to sort of rethink your, your conclusion. Or uh, what if there's a vulnerability in a domain controller, uh, say in a print spooler where Microsoft releases, releases a patch that doesn't fully fix the issue? That would never happen. But knowing that exists, you would have to uh, then consider, will your conclusion or, or uh, scenario of, uh, or decision that you were protected hold up over the next one, six, 24, 48 hours? Um, another diagnostic technique, uh, analysis of competing hypotheses. So this one is uh, basically identifying all of the reasonable alternative explanations uh, and then just weighing the evidence against them to determine whether your evidence supports or, or refutes uh, these potential hypotheses. And this, this is specifically done without conjecturing about the probability of the hypothesis being true, hypothesis being true. Uh, and the goal is to take your data, uh, your, your bits of evidence, weigh it against each of the hypothesis and decide if each piece of evidence you have either supports it, uh, supports that particular, particular hypothesis, refutes that particular hypothesis, or maybe doesn't contribute to it in any meaningful way. Um, you go through one at a time and you create a matrix of uh, uh, which bits of evidence support or refute which hypotheses you have with the goal of refuting or, or disproving hypotheses, not with the goal of proving hypotheses. And that's to prevent you from uh, grabbing on to one particular result you might favor for one particular reason or, or feel is the most likely. You're not trying to do that. You're trying to make sure that you've identified all of the possible potential uh, hypotheses. Uh, it reminds me of a quote, uh, a sort of famous one, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, improbable must be the truth, which is, of course, from HouseMD. Uh, an InfoSec example, you're asked to investigate the defacement of an internal wiki page. Someone has replaced all the tutorial videos with links to hardcore porn. Uh, the logs don't show any edits. Um, in fact, you don't see any activity on those pages for several years. So uh, how might you go about using ACH to uh, figure out or help you come up with a conclusion as to what might have happened? Well, you might uh, conjecture that uh, could an admin have made the changes and scrubbed the logs, and that might be possible. Could an engineer have made the changes in the back end, and that's why your logs don't match up? Uh, could an external attacker have compromised the wiki system in some way that you don't know about yet? Or could the videos themselves have changed somehow? And uh, hopefully it's clear to a lot of you that I'm alluding to a, a recent event where a company purchased a domain that used to host fairly innocuous videos um, and on that domain now hosts hardcore porn. And as a result, it's showing up in a lot of uh, old pages that haven't been touched in a while because it, it, it's true, the actual videos themselves are what have changed. So then we get to uh, contrarian techniques. Uh, probably the one that people are, are most familiar with is devil's advocacy. Uh, however, I've noticed that some people, some people understand the term devil's advocacy to mean arguing the opposite viewpoint or, or taking a, an intentionally contrary viewpoint uh, to argue with. In the context of the original uh, government, U.S. government document, uh, they actually use this as saying uh, it's more like red teaming your analysis. It's taking your own analysis and then having another faction or, or you playing you know, another role in this analysis process, attacking your own analysis to find weaknesses, things that might not be supported, things that might be uh, not quite as reliable uh, uh, as you are using them in the final analysis. It's uh, intended to allow you to test whether your key assumptions will hold up under different circumstances, and it helps you identify faulty logic. So uh, an information security example of devil's advocacy, uh, a bit of a scenario for this one. You're wrapping up a report on what has happened during an event. You're mostly confident you've arrived at the right conclusion as to how an attacker was able to gain access to a database and exfiltrate some data, but the stakes are high. Um, let's just say, if this happens again, your company's going under. It's really important. You, you have to be 100% certain about this. Given that it's so important, how, what can you do 
to ensure that the result that you've came up with or uh, uh, your, your hypothetical scenario is as accurate as it possibly can be. Well, that's where you'd bust out devil's advocacy. So maybe you would take one of your really good analysts or uh, uh, maybe it's you uh, sort of functioning in this, this particular role, but for, for this uh, purposes of this, we'll say you have one of your other analysts look at your report. They specifically start going through your report, looking for weaknesses in the things that you've assumed, weaknesses in the evidence, uh, potential faults that might uh, disqualify some infinite evidence that you're using. They just basically tear it apart. And while they're doing that to create a report of these are all the things that are a problem with this analysis, and then they present that to the group. Now, the group can take a look at that and go, no, well, you know, they can, they can argue it. They say, well, you know, this really is founded because of whatever reason. Or they might say, all right, you're right. We need to go find some additional corroborating evidence to support this one particular piece because it's sort of a weak pillar of the final result. Um, and, and that helps you make sure that your final product is based on the strongest of possible um, determinations from the process. Uh, very similar to devil's advocacy is uh, team A, team B analysis. A lot of people get these mixed up. And in fact, if you do a team A, team B analysis wrong, you can end up turning it into devil's advocacy. But uh, there's a slight difference in that um, team A, team B is used when you have two potential results or, or final conclusions that are sort of equally probable or at least equally of equal confidence. And you're not quite sure which one is the stronger one. Um, what you might do in that situation is to take each of those hypotheses and give them to two different teams and allow each team to pursue them as their own analysis. Um, one of the often uh, uh, used additional sort of tricks in, for a team A, team B analysis is to take somebody who is in favor of one particular outcome and put them on the team of the opposite outcome. And it isn't just to sort of make them angry. It's because they may have insights or understand connections between the data they're working with that the other team hasn't realized. And it allows you to sort of do some cross-pollination of that understanding of the issue. So how might you use that in information security? So you and your team are trying to decide how best to reduce the number of malware incidents you're experiencing within your organization. Uh, let's say you have limited budget and time and engineering resources. And uh, you can only really go with one thing. One uh, group of your analysts uh, wants a strategy involving endpoint policies, updates, changes to something on the endpoint. And the other group of analysts is really uh, thinks that the right way to go is to put money into some network leaky box, uh, uh, anti-malware boxes that can stop stuff before it even gets to the endpoint. Um, so one thing you might do in that situation is you might decide to give each of those two groups uh, or, or tell each of those two groups to run with that idea and produce an analysis why their solution is the best option, why they, we shouldn't consider the other option. Um, and you might use the trick of sort of cross-pollinating by taking people that are an advocate of endpoint uh, restrictions and put them on the network uh, restrictions team and, and vice versa and sort of get that um, that cross-pollination. But the, the final bit is you have sort of an agreed upon sort of formal uh, judgment method. Uh, maybe it's just, you know, the relevant manager decides which one was most compelling, or maybe you have a, a, a team of experts who listens to the arguments and they decide which one was the most compelling or who had the, uh, the best argument for that particular way forward. It's a bit of a debate tactic, um, but it can allow you to pull uh, the best out of two potential in very close situations. So uh, high impact, low probability anal uh, analysis. This is for when you have an event that would have dire consequences if it happened, but no one thinks it will happen. Um, it's very useful when decision makers are convinced that an event is unlikely, but maybe haven't given sufficient thought to uh, the consequences uh, of its occurrence. They've kind of dismissed it because it's, it's very unlikely. Uh, it can be used to uncover hidden relationships, and it can help uh, analysts develop signposts, from kind of like we were talking earlier, uh, which can provide early warnings of a, a shift in, in the situation. How do you do it? Uh, you define the high impact outcome clearly, like what is actually going to happen if this occurs. Uh, and then you devise one or more pathways uh, of series of events that could potentially get you there. You start from 
uh, known good and work your way towards uh, the high impact event. That's important uh, when comparing this with a future technique we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, you insert possible triggers or changes that could affect the outcome, right? Maybe it seems very unlikely because um, no one has the proper keys or access to the proper keys. So maybe a triggering event might be keys get released or you know keys are exposed somehow. Uh, that might change this whole uh, scenario and now you need to rethink how actual uh, low probability it is. Anyway, you identify a, a set of indicators for each pathway that can be monitored. Uh, and then you set about monitoring those things so that, uh, you know, it, assuming you can't do anything to fundamentally reduce this risk or remove this risk, uh, at least now you have a set of indicators so you may get some advanced warning as it's coming uh, and be able to take corrective actions. An example of this, say you're uh, concerned that your organization is not taking the risk of having too many unnecessary domain admins seriously. Uh, most of the domain admins don't need that level of permission, but the stakeholders believe it hasn't been a problem uh, and it makes changes quicker in an emergency. Um, obviously something we've heard in the past. It also makes, uh, uh, keeps security from being a bottleneck because they don't have to ask for permission if they've got you know, full heads to everything. You're concerned because they're of the risk of a compromised admin credential or uh, what kind of damage an internal attacker might be able to do. So maybe you conduct a high impact, low probability analysis. Uh, you highlight the huge impact that happens if this very low prob uh, probability event occurs. You identify several pathways that could occur, right? Credentials get leaked. There's weak passwords chosen by the people who have these. Um, maybe an internal attacker is having a really bad day or get some news they don't like. You know, that, that might in fact uh, impact things. You identify potential indicators that these events are occurring, right? At least now you've got some idea of what to look for. You may not be able to fix the situation. Hopefully you're working on the organization to reduce the, the number of admins there are. Um, but you've got some things you can watch for. You can look for indications that uh, leak credentials and uh, or credentials have been leaked. You can test for very weak passwords in some ways. There might be some stuff you can do. Um, so a what if analysis. Uh, a what if analysis is often confused with a high impact low likelihood analysis but it really is almost a high impact low likelihood analysis done backwards with high impact low likelihood analysis you start at a base state and construe a path where you may arrive at the high impact event with a what if analysis you start with the high impact event and then work your way back to identify the things that would have had to have happened for that scenario to, to occur um, it's basically just coming from the other direction. Uh, so you, you start by assuming the event has happened. You select some triggering events that may have permitted the scenario to unfold. Um, you develop a chain of argument as to how the out could, out put, uh, outcome could have come about. And you work backwards, as I mentioned, and you generate a list of indicators for each of those stages. So now you've, uh, uh, with your high impact, low likelihood uh, analysis, identified things you might monitor or, or consider important for detecting if it's starting or in progress. You've now got additional uh, indicators for if activity is happening in each stage. And so maybe the event has occurred and now you're finding it before it works its way back down the chain. An information security example, uh, consider again that same scenario where you're concerned about potential for domain admin credentials to become compromised. Instead, this time, assume they're already compromised. How did that happen, right? And so maybe as a result of that, you might identify the same vectors as before, like leak pack, leak passwords, or inside attackers. Um, however, maybe because you're thinking the other direction this time, it might occur to you that maybe the help desk dumped some caches off of something because someone logged in with admin creds and whatever it was was set up to cache that. Uh, you, know, you, you might, as a result of that, decide, well, uh, I'm going to add to the list of things I can watch, watch for or do, check for excessive hash caching, uh, of, especially of domain admin creds. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe there's something you can do to make sure you're catching if people are using domain admin creds for like needless local logins. Um, you've now got a little more information of things you might look for in your environment to detect these specific types of problems. And on, on to the, uh, the imaginative thinking techniques, I think these are probably the most obvious uh, to people or the easiest to, for people to wrap their head around. People are used to the idea of, of brainstorming. They've heard that uh, term a lot. Um, 
the the interesting thing is again the source material talks about brainstorming as a group activity um in in obviously because they're doing sort of structured games and things to bring about brainstorming i think when we just say brainstorming we we think of it often as just coming up with things off the top of your head uh, you know that might be off, uh, off the wall and that's true and you can do that by yourself but in this context they're talking about it as a, a group activity um basically it's 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 quickly generating a range of hypotheses that can then be refined, tested, further developed, or discarded. It just creates raw material you can work from, some ideas, things that you can then later go and do, you know, um, uh, test your evidence against and see which of those you can discard as right off the bat as, oh, well, that's not going to happen. I have evidence that couldn't be the result. Um, but it just generates you things to work with, gives you uh, uh, more creative points to start your analysis with. Um, typically, in terms of a structured analytical technique, this is done by assembling a group of analysts with others relevant uh, or others with relevant knowledge. You freeform generate ideas which can plausibly fit the supplied evidence, and you never censor an idea. You take whatever people throw at you, and no matter how outlandish, and you throw it up on the board. But if it's real outlandish, you kind of use that as an opportunity to find out what, where did that occur to you? What are you thinking? Maybe there's some information in that connection, right? It didn't occur to you to think that, but they might have some uh, understanding that caused them to, you know, uh, to reach that conclusion. Or maybe they're thinking about the problem space in a completely different way, and that's why it seems oddball to you. But when you talk to them about it, it'll seem less oddball. Uh, how might you use that in InfoSec? So uh, your new Internet of Things product uh, must store credentials and tokens so that it can communicate with your service. However, the selected hardware doesn't contain a secure, a secure element. Um, it doesn't have any way to securely store the material or resist recovery. We'll just assume in this, this fictional device, you can always get these creds off of it. How might you re address the risks of credential theft or cloning? What? I don't know, but maybe we would use brainstorming. You might come up with some ideas. Maybe there's some other immutable characteristic of the device we can use to identify it. Maybe we don't need to store a specific token. Maybe we just don't have credentials and tokens in the first place. What if we rethought how the product works and just got rid of them somehow? Or maybe it's a feature. Maybe we want people to clone them. Maybe that's a great idea and it enables you know, some sort of other business model for us with this same widget. Um, so red team analysis, I, I think it's, a, it's another technique, but I think it specifically in this context, we have to be careful uh, to understand what red team analysis is uh, actually means. Uh, it's more in the context used in these structured analytical techniques of what I would consider a threat simulation or an adversary simulation, meaning uh, uh, you are determining, you're analyzing what the red team might be able to do uh, instead of red teaming your analysis. So uh, how would you do it? Uh, analyst takes on the position of a potential adversary just you know, tries it on uh, in the thought space and, and tries to keep in mind the motivations and the constraints the adversary is driven by or restricted by. Uh, and then they develop a list of first person questions the adversary may be trying to answer for themselves. How would I interpret this particular result? Or what would my next prior, if I reach a certain point uh, of exploitation, what would my next priority be? Because what is my ultimate goal? It might be specific to these threat actors. Uh, you then lay out and prioritize all the possible next steps an adversary, an adversary may take based on the answers you came up with to those questions when you were sort of play acting in that role. Um, and of course, the reason you do that and lay out and prioritize all those possible next steps is now you've got another set of great things you can look for and monitor that will help you figure out if these, these sort of activities are occurring in your environment. An information security example. So uh, you've set up several high interaction honeypot, uh, honeypots in various places on your network's periphery. Uh, you notice a potential attacker uh, always connects sort of at the same time. They connect real quick. They, they get in. They run a, a few meaningless seeming commands where they just check the user ID to make sure they're root. Uh, and you know maybe they enumerate some processes and dump some uh, information about you know, what kernel it's running. And then they leave. And they just do that over and over and over and never do anything more with it. So uh, you might find yourself, well, what's wrong? Uh, what's wrong with my honeypots, right? Well, you might conjecture, well, maybe the attacker's detecting it's a honeypot and just dropping off. 
So maybe I need to change something up. Or you might um, decide that the attacker is really looking for a specific type of host. Maybe they need a certain type of processor, certain you know, code revision uh, to, to pull off, whatever it is they're looking to exploit this host for. And, and that's why they're not interested in it. Uh, or does the attacker have uh, a lot of compromised systems already? And they're just doing this because they want to know if it's still active. They're just keeping it in the loop in case they ever need it someday. And maybe it's all automated. Maybe no human has ever done this. Some bot just popped your honeypot and reported, oh, yeah, I got something great. Uh, and it goes into some list and C2, and they'll use it someday, maybe. Um, it, knowing uh, the viewpoint of your attacker, like why they may be doing that, in this scenario, I threw in, you know, oh, the IPs tips you off that it's some specific actor. I don't think that normally happens, but let's assume, uh, you know, you could say, oh, well, I understand uh, from this attacker's point of view, you know, they've got a ton of these things. So likely if we keep watching it, eventually they'll come back and want to actually use this for something useful to them. Uh, so what have we learned? Uh, we're, we're, uh, Learned if you're concerned about information quality, then use diagnostic techniques. If you're concerned about information biases, use contrarian techniques. If you're concerned about information completeness, use imaginative thinking techniques. And uh, where can you learn more? The document that I started with is fantastic. Uh, it goes way into more depth. You should really read it if you found any of this interesting. Um, there's another great document. Uh, from the RAND Corporation, where they analyze the first document and then decide whether they think it's good or not. That's fantastic. Uh, and then there is a book, Structured Analytic Techniques for Intelligence Analysis uh, by Richard Hewer and Randolph Pearson. Uh, it's $900 on Amazon, so I didn't read that at all. I hear it's really good. Uh, if someone can get me a copy of that book, I would love to read it, but I'm definitely not paying 900 bucks. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm Rabbit. I'm pretty easy to find on Twitter. Uh, you can email rabbit at rabbit.com, just use the right sixes. Uh, I will respond. There's PGP keys, keys around. And uh, thank you for listening to me blabber uh, for a half hour about structured